So I'm Lucy Greco. I am the accessibility and evangelist for UC Berkeley. And what that means is I help people understand what it means to be digitally accessible. I work with application developers and website developers to create the most accessible environments we possibly can. I also test different products that we buy and I look at different things and work with companies to make the products we buy more effective for UC Berkeley. So today I'm gonna to talk about what the pandemic has done when it comes to the digital environment for accessibility and what the experiences of people with disabilities were during the pandemic. All right. Page change, slide two of 13. As the world shut down, the web became more critical than ever before. So it did for all of us. We all went online. We all had to do a lot more online with the computers we already were using and the tools we already had. Uh, schools required students to work or do their homework from home and take their classes from home. Offices went completely remote and people were working from home. We had hundreds of people who had to access the internet who probably weren't comfortable with doing that on a daily basis. Other technologies that we were using all of a sudden became key and focused. So for example, I've used online conferencing software for years, but a lot of my blind friends did not. So the first time they were invited to a remote meeting like this, they had to learn how to use that technology. Page change, slide three of 13, the story of going all online for people with disabilities. So I've got some stuff in here that's not online related on these bullets, but I'm going to explain those to you. We had to go online and we had to do it fast and quickly. In fact, I think from one day I was at the office and the next day I was told it's a permanent work from home until further notice. And that happened to all of us. So a blind person working from home now needed to have a laptop at home or a computer. They needed to have a microphone. They needed to have a camera. And that's how they would get their schoolwork or get their work done. But we had other parts of our life, very critical parts of our life that were now having to be done remotely. So you'll note I talk about grocery stores in my bullets. And this is really key. About five days into the pandemic, a really close friend of mine called me up and said, how are you buying your groceries? I went to Safeway the other day and they turned me away because they said they couldn't guide me through the store to find my groceries. And that's a really horrific image. When you think about a person who up until this point was able to independently go to the grocery store and just talk to the clerk and tell them what the items they needed were and be guided around the store to find the items they needed, was now told, we cannot stay six feet away from you if we're guiding you, so you need to leave and we can't sell you the products you need to survive. Uh, applications like Instacart, which is very popular here in the US, to order groceries, were difficult to use. And if you didn't already have an account, they were really tough to learn without somebody there to help you. Usually when a blind person wants to use an application, they usually get a friend to walk them through and the two of them will sit over their phone or sit over the computer and work together to try and figure out what the workarounds or tips and tricks are to make that work for them. Well, you couldn't do that anymore because your friends couldn't come over. And to top it all off, Instacart was going through labor problems. So when you used to be able to order same day, now you had to wait six to 10 days. And if you didn't you know, hoard like everyone else before the pandemic started, you couldn't get the things you needed. You couldn't get those necessities. Prescription drugs, now what do you do? You can't go to the pharmacy to get your prescription drugs. How do you get those things? Page change, slide four of 13, people with disabilities all had the same needs. So let's talk about what everybody else in the world had. And when I say the same needs, I'm saying 
everybody had the needs. We had to learn how to use online tools more effectively. We had to get groceries. We had to actually find out what was happening in this pandemic. We needed news. We needed information about what to do, what the restrictions were, et cetera, et cetera. Page change, slide five of 13, demo. So now I'm going to demonstrate two web pages for you to give you a sense of what a blind person experiences using the web to try and get the kind of information that previous slide talked about. StreamYard, StreamYard, COVID-19, what does accessibility, COVID-19, COVID-19 live media coverage by? So this is a media coverage dashboard from Nexus Lexus, and it's a, um, this is a best in class for data information. Uh, you've probably all seen hundreds and hundreds of data visualizations and data clouds and all kinds of charts and information about, you know, what the infection rate is in your area, so forth, what the uh, reinfection rate is and so forth. Most of those charts to me were completely unreadable. As far as my screen reader was concerned, they didn't exist or all I heard was graphic or numbers that weren't connected or related to each other in any way. Now I'm telling you that this is best in class before I start showing it to you. I'm gonna tell you that it actually has a couple of tweaks that could be made and I've already spoken to the people who've created this page to get them to make those tweaks. And that hopefully will be coming soon. So I'm gonna just start at the top of the page to get you all used to hearing the voice, listening to it. And then we're gonna go in and explore the data. Link Lexus Nexus. All right. Link Lexus Nexus logo, link graphic Lexus Nexus logo. Heading level three Nexus news desk trademark. Graphic COVID-19 microvirus. Heading level one COVID-19 and a global media landscape. Heading level two, a global media and news tracker from Nexus News Desk trademark. Heading level two, what media monitoring tells us about the coronavirus. COVID-19 continues to impact the lives of people all around the world. Financial markets are in flux. Travel restrictions are in effect. And many are struggling to find basic household supplies while people are stockpiling for potential quarantine. Our interactive charts provide insight into the way coronavirus is developing across the global media landscape in near real time. Heading level 3 COVID-19 cases, coverage, and S&P 500 over time button collapsed. Frame chart. High charts interactive chart. Region clickable chart screen reader information. Region heading level 5 chart. Combination chart with 3 data series. The chart has 1x axis displaying time. Range, 20, 20, 0, 7, 17, 22 hours, 59 minutes and 24 seconds to 20, 20, 10, 28, 36 seconds. The chart has three Y-axis displaying mentions confirmed cases and S&P 500 index. Out of region, clickable confirmed cases, series 2 of 3. Bar series with 101 bars. Y-axis, confirmed cases region graphic 1. Saturday. June 18, 2300 hours, 14,287,418 cases. Confirmed cases. Graphic 2. Sunday, June 19, 2300 hours, 14,501,583 cases. So I'm going to stop it there, and you'll note that it read the text really nicely. Then it gave me a description of that chart. And then it actually started going into the chart. The fixes I'm recommending to them, just so you know, is that you'll see that there are three y-axis, but actually I'm only hearing two of those y-axis. I am only... Graphic 20. Sorry, my, my husband just told me to make the visual port come down lower. So you'll see that it's showing visually to you what the um, cases are as well as the S&P 500. I'm only hearing the date and cases. And we aren't sure why it's doing that yet, but I need to hear that data. 
I would also like that to be broken up a little bit. And I would also like, instead of hearing those dates as a large string of numbers with a 2400 clock, I'd like to hear that separated a little bit more out so that I'm getting less than a numeric data. Uh, you know, just a large string of numbers gets to be really hard. So I'm going to just let you hear one or two more of them so you can hear how hard it is to pick out the date and pick out the cases if you're listening, not quite with a good ear on it. 28 Friday, uh, 14, 2300 hours, 21,206,137 cases. That Confirmed one, cases. Graphic. That one read properly because I moved in a different way. Now I'm going to move in the same way I was moving before. Graphic 29. Saturday, graphic 30. Sunday, August 16, 2300 hours, 21,666,057 cases. Confirmed cases. So that's how that data looks. This is actually a much easier to understand chart than some of the ones I've seen on COVID. I still don't know where I can go and get daily infectious rates and where my county infectious rates are. It's just not accessible to me. Now I'm going to show you a, another demonstration. One, NWS bull. So this is a tweet that was sent out and this is not to do with the pandemic, but I think it actually gets the criticality of accessibility across 100%. This is a tweet that was sent out just last week telling people to look at a map for their evacuation um, plans and determine if they were in an evacuation zone. I want you to listen closely to hear what the blind person seeing this tweet would hear. Main landmark, conversation region. NWS Boulder verified account at NWS Boulder number East Troublesome Fire. Please read this updated statement regarding evacuations in the Grand County area. Number calcs number co-fire image three replies, 144 retweets, 189 likes article. So visually you see a document there with some text on it. All I heard was the word image. If I was in this evacuation zone, I would not have known that I was at risk or not at risk. We'll go back to our presentation now. What does accessibility look like during a pandemic? Google Slides camera or microphone. Okay, and we'll move on. Page changed slide six of 13. So now what can I do? And this is a call to action. So how do you as a person working on development uh, affect this? The best thing you can do is think about accessibility and start wondering how your own work is impacted. As we had in that little conversation before the talk, the front end is really important, but how does the back end developer support accessibility? by thinking about it and making sure that the pathways for that accessibility is there. So for example, in Twitter, that tweet could have been sent out with alt text on the image. Twitter has allowed alt text to be added to images. Uh, a really good example is you'll note that the tweet for the conference has an image in it and that tweet does not actually include any alt text. But if you look at my own timeline, I am Access Aces on Twitter, and you'll see that I retweeted an image of a copy of that tweet sent out by the Microsoft Accessibility Team, where they actually added alt text to the image for us. And anybody can add alt text in, in Twitter. It's just something that you need to know to do. And the big problem is, and this is a slight kind of smack to Twitter saying, it's not there by default. People can send tweets without ever knowing that they have the ability to add that alt text. You actually have to know and you have to dig and turn it on 
and look for it. And it's so easy to just send a tweet with a picture with no alt text, just like the Colorado fire map. Page change, slide 7 of 13. We are all feeling a lot of stress and anxiety. Keep the information overload down. So this is some basic information about how you actually convey information to people. When you're creating an informational dashboard, and I know most of you here are developers that are not doing front end, but still think about this. Keep your data presentation simple. Don't give people everything at once. Give them the ability to just digest small chunks, clean, simple, easy to understand bits of information. Keep the most important, <clears throat> most asked for information up front. And as developers creating the frameworks for them to actually see this data and for people to present the data, make sure that you provide the capability for them to do things like add the alt text, label the images, different things like that. Accessibility is simplicity most of the time. And I'm betting that all of you can get overwhelmed when you see these giant dashboards that are being presented by different states and governments. Page change, slide 8 of 13. Make sure that data can be used and accessed by everyone. So that's just a kind of repetition. It's make sure that people can access the information. Um, early on in the pandemic, California, who's been doing a really good job of responding to the pandemic, the governor issued an order, uh, and that order was a PDF that was an image. And the bad thing about that is that PDF that was an image, not only was it inaccessible to me as a screen reader user, but say somebody wanted to quote that, it's a lot easier to cut and paste text than it is to grab a portion of an image PDF and share that text. So if all somebody wanted to do was copy the restrictions from that PDF, they literally had to go through a lot more machinations and probably had to retype it instead of being able to just copy and paste. When the data is accessible and easy to use, it's actually much easier to digest through APIs and other types of technologies as well. Page change, slide nine of 13. Crises are not the time to change your design. So this is a really important factor. And this is again, when you think about it for front end, but I think it's still important to, to know as a developer working on something. There are rules for accessibility that tell you what color contrasts you should use. And there are rules that talk about how to structure information, semantic structure of web pages, um, how to create proper tables, how to do, Everything from making sure that your foreground color and your background color have enough contrast that somebody with low vision or somebody who's older and may have started to lose their vision. Use the W3C guidelines for creating your pages, creating your applications. Make sure that you're following those rules and don't do it during a pandemic. You should have a good style guide a good design pattern to work from, from the start. When you're working on your applications and you're working on your design, think about accessibility then. Page change, slide 10 of 13. Do I have to tell you to caption videos? I think that one I wanted to throw in just in case. If you're putting video content up, which a lot of these people were, you should caption those videos. You should, if possible, have an interpreter in the video if somebody, if it's just a talking head. So several states were caught out in that they had public meetings and they did not have interpreters and deaf people were not able to get the contents of the meeting because they did not have captions and they did not have interpreters. Interpreters might have been a lot harder to come by in the pandemic but captions are easy. You see that I have them on here. They're working, they're 
There might not be perfect because I'm using auto captions, but caption, caption, caption. And if you're recording a video to show later, edit those captions. Let the auto captions start the process, but edit them and make it cleaner and fix it for everyone. Tools like PowerPoint and Google Slides let you caption automatically. Do it. Page change, slide 11 of 13. Accessibility only helps you reach more people more effectively. So why? Why do you care about accessibility? You know, there's 21 million people, uh, according to some statistics, other statistics say 50 million people around the world that need accessibility features of some sort or other. Why would you limit your audience from those people? Why would you not share that information with the world? It's going to be a good thing for you to do no matter what you do. And everyone in this room will also be affected by it in some way or other. After all, how many of you are actually using those captions as an assistant to what I'm saying to follow along? Page change, slide 12 of 13. Accessibility done early and as part of development costs less. So as I said two slides ago, build accessibility into your process at the very beginning. Think about what you need to do with your technology to make it accessible from the very start. If you're creating a framework, think about that framework being used by a person who's using a screen reader. Can they actually move back and forth to get the different items and controls and tools they need? We are having a big struggle right now because one of the major software packages that we're having all students use on campus is not usable by a person with a screen reader. They did not think about accessibility to create the particular software environment that these students are going to need to learn in in an accessible way. So they cannot take the courses that require that and those courses are required to graduate. And if you do it at the beginning, nobody has to go back and fix it. It's just a regular part of development. Think about accessibility like anything else you would do in your, in your development cycle. You don't create a product that's insecure and patch it later. You don't create something that requires maintenance and without the maintenance or build path, you have to do it from the start. Page change, slide 13 of 13. Thank you for helping people with disabilities access our digital world. That's my presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, thank you so much. Um, I gotta say, you know, for me, when I was uh, uh, tweeting about this conference, um, only the very first two, three tweets perhaps had an alt text for the image that was embedded. Yep. And then after that, I just forgot. I'm like, you know, it's it's a challenge because um, it's a habit that I, I don't have and I don't have because it, it's something that I, I don't fear. And what advice do you give to us on creating that habit? You know, like how, how do you make it to change? I, this is where I blame Twitter in that they've done a great job in making the facility available, but they haven't made it the default. If you were tweeting and had that edit field sitting there flashing at you saying, add alt text for the blind and visually impaired, you wouldn't miss it but because you have to click on something to look for it and then add it, it's not, it's not readily available to you. You know, you're sending a picture, you're tweeting, you want to get that over and done with. It's not you, I don't blame you. <laughs> so, so the, the thing is, uh, you, I, I, I'm feeling that you agree, recognize it is challenging for people to proactively remember all the time. So it should be up to platforms to remember people, hey, this is this is important. You should don't forget this, right? Exactly. It's up to the platform to create the environment where people can't fail. People, okay, this is yeah, people are 
likely to fail. If you give a person the opportunity to fail, they will. But if you make it so the person is less likely to fail, you're helping them to succeed. This is a, yeah, this is an excellent feedback for any product person, anybody working on UI design, UX, you know, um, when I when I see developers thinking about front end UI development, they think, how can I make this cool and awesome? And most of the time it's spent on design on on making it, you know, sharp and colorful and uh, easy for the mouse to click on. But what about those that cannot even use the mouse? You know, so interesting. Yep. exactly. Can you get to it with a keyboard? So on um, on this slide, I have um, the website for the department I work at, webaccess.berkeley.edu. And on that website, we have something called the DYI checklist. And on that checklist is what any developer can do to test their work. You know, how do you check what your work, you know, go through this spreadsheet for every project you're working on. Can you actually use it with a keyboard and we describe what that means and we tell people how to go through and check with a keyboard. Check your color contrast, use some of the accessibility automated tools. The one point I didn't make that I should have made during this presentation is the best way for you to ever learn how accessible your work is work with people with disabilities, bring someone like me in who is a real assistive technology user and have them test your work or better yet, have them be one of the developers on your team. Blind people are coders as well as sighted people, people who use uh, puff and switch, uh, puff and sip switches can code. Have a person with a disability be there on your team as a contributing member to your team. And I can guarantee you, no one on your team, unless that person is a real jerk, is going to want their product not be usable by that person. You know, Bruno, you have a coworker. How would you like to make something for that coworker that they can't use? You're not going to do it. You're going to think about them every time you code. Yeah. Yeah. So hire people with disabilities. That's that's a very great thought. Um, I I have a I have a joke with uh, Antonio Goncalves, a friend of mine. In um, he lives in France. Maybe you, maybe you've heard about Antonio Goncalves. He's a Java champion, and uh, uh, he's part of this community. And uh, his he has now uh, decades of experience. And then one day we were talking about like all kinds of driven developments. And then we came up with like a huge list customer driven development, business driven development, test driven development. Where is the empathy driven development, right? Where is that approach for software development that is focused on empathy, on 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 thinking on not on ju just the user need for working with the functionality, but really thinking on the person, not the user, but the person right behind that. Exactly. I mean, I can guarantee you a product that I find inaccessible, you're going to find difficult to use. I mean, making something accessible just ultimately makes that product better for everyone. And yeah. by having, having the empathy for what those users are, use cases that include people with disabilities as part of the design, as part of the build is really, really key. Yep. Yeah. Well, Lucy, thank you so much for your presentation. We're going to have this video uh, available on demand uh, later this week or the week after. Uh, I'm sure uh, Microsoft has a Microsoft Accessibility uh, program, and they have been tweeting uh, about this conference and your session in particular. Um, I'm sure your presentation will be a great resource for Microsoft and for anyone um, who is able to reach to your video that you just showed us. So uh, I, all I can say is thank you so much for your time here. Thank you for letting me come here and speak to this audience. Awesome. You have a great day, and uh, I hope you can tune in for other uh, sessions if you feel interested about. But most importantly, we took some notes, uh, and uh, we're going to see if we can get everybody to enable their captions and make sure that uh, uh, people don't forget. All right. Thank you very much, and you have a great day. Thank you so much. Right. Bye, Lucy. Bye-bye. All right, so to everyone watching,
So here's the thing. We had a very interesting day today. Uh, Ishelle Ruse with her um, uh, keynote about how the world is is changing. Uh, at the end, we had this session from, from Lucid about uh, accessibility. And in between, we had technology talks. And that's just for all of us to think about how important it is that when we're doing software development, we start with people, developers, but as people. And then we end with people. We end with people using that technology. Anything that happens in between is just technology. It's just are just tools that we have at our hand to build something great for people. So I hope you enjoyed this first day. I hope you um, uh, will join tomorrow again. Uh, let me show you the schedule for tomorrow. So I'm going to share here my screen and bring you up to speed for the second day. So here is um, the keynote tomorrow. We're going to have uh, Martin Verberg and George Adams. Uh, Martin and George came from J Clarity last year. They, um, um, George works with me on the product management for Java at Microsoft. Martin is the Java engineering group manager, and uh, they are both working on, on, on OpenJDK uh, initiatives here at Microsoft. Um, you're going to hear more about Microsoft Java, uh, Microsoft and Java, not Microsoft Java, Microsoft and Java, and how our team is working, collaborating with these open source projects, OpenJDK, Adopt OpenJDK, and others. <clears throat> and then for the rest of the day, of the morning, or evening, depending on which time zone you are, we're going to have uh, these speakers and these sessions. So we're going to start with Venkat. Then you're going to head over to Trisha G, uh, talking about IntelliJ, Emily Young for MicroProfile, Monica Backwith from our own Java Engineering Group team talking about OpenJDK port for Windows on ARM, Kate Stanley for uh, Patch Kafka Streaming, uh, Melissa McKay from JFrog will join us to talk about DevOps. Uh, Jesse G will talk about the LinkedIn effort to move to Java 11. As you may know, Java 8 is still widely used. That also happens here at Microsoft. And LinkedIn is invested in working on moving everything to Java 11. Um, finally, you're going to have this session from uh, Mario Gray, who works at VMware. Uh, for beautiful spring uh, uh, deployments. So um, tune in tomorrow if you if you can. If you cannot make it tomorrow, all videos will be available uh, later on demand on YouTube and on Microsoft Channel 9. So um, with that, I just want to remember, if you are working with Spring, uh, take a look at this survey. We are trying to get more feedback from users for our mm -hmm. engineering team working with uh, Java on Azure and Spring on Azure. The more information we have, the better we can uh, build a better project, product. product. And uh, you can even get a uh, run for a $150 uh, dollar gift certificate so if you got chosen. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing, we have this JDConf challenge on the Microsoft Learn platform. So just hit aka.ms slash JDConf slash challenge. You get to a nice uh, selection of uh, tutorials. We have more resources for learning. So um, just slash JDK com slash resources. You can also check learn.microsoft.com for all things that Microsoft has uh, to help you build your um, or bump up your skills in cloud and other technologies. So um, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Um, thank you so much for your time. And we'll see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Have a great day.